Now, before you get your pitchforks, I still think Valheim is an amazing game. It's the perfect example of what an early access game should be. It's well made and almost entirely bug free. It has a level of polish I'd expect from a finished game from a larger company. The systems in place are nothing short of impressive. Actual survival mechanics, food that actually works with the survival system to add depth to your playthrough. Building that is a snap to feature but also allows for a degree of free placement while still being bound by a working stability system. Functional terrain deformation which by itself sets Valheim well above and beyond the competition. And my co-op sessions were seamless. I can't stress it enough, Valheim is a fantastic product even in its early access state, and for a price of $20 it is 100% worth it. I went into this game expecting it to be overrated given all the hype, but was pleasantly surprised to see it actually lived up to the hype and really delivered where countless survival games before it had failed. So if you're watching this video to see whether or not Valheim is worth your money, I'd say right out of the gate, for 96% of you the answer is going to be yes. And that you should understand that me not liking Valheim puts me in the absolute minority here. And even I can recognize on an objective level that Valheim is a good game. So this video is not at all an attempt to convince you that Valheim is a bad game or that you should hate it, because I really respect what it is and what it accomplishes. But even with all that said, I kinda didn't like it. In fact, I didn't really enjoy playing it at all, which felt incredibly weird since finding bad reviews for this game is nearly impossible. I was almost starting to feel a little gaslit with the juxtaposition of my relatively miserable playthrough and the near universal praise of the game on every media outlet, and the total inability to even find proper negative reviews of the game. Or at the very least, reviews that brought up some of the issues I was having. And so at the risk of sounding redundant, this video is not designed to convince anyone that Valheim is a bad game, because it isn't. And it isn't designed to in some way bring misfortune to the developers, because let's be real, even if I wanted this game to fail, and I don't, that ship has sailed. The developers could retire tomorrow and never have to work another day in their lives. A single negatively focused video from a nobody channel on YouTube is not going to change that. The purpose of this video is to give some negative feedback in a way that is constructive and should hopefully bring some catharsis to all three of the other people who didn't like Valheim. Fair warning though, for the sake of making an informed review I did play through the entirety of the game and killed all five bosses. I'll put some spoiler warnings before discussing certain boss fights, but we will be discussing everything about Valheim in this video. The game is also still in early access. I fully expect a lot of what I talk about to change in the future, so don't take this video as some final review of the game. If you've been on the internet for even a few seconds in the last 9 months, then you've probably already heard of Valheim. You play as a dead viking warrior who has been summoned by Odin to the lands of Valheim to vanquish his foes before they become too powerful. You're given a push in the right direction for your first boss, and a bit of tutorial from Hugin, who acts as your guide throughout the game. The format should be fairly familiar. You set about punching trees, crafting tools, getting a modest home built to house your goods, and do some crafting before going on to larger adventures. The key difference this time is that you can't immediately craft a pickaxe like most survival games. To do so, you'll have to kill the first boss. It's a neat way to tell the player that it's not just a survival crafting game, there's an adventure with objectives to complete. And generally speaking, I like the boss fights a ton. We'll talk about them more in detail later, but even the most dedicated contrarian would have to admit that fighting your first boss in Valheim is a cool experience. You'll probably also be bumping into a black forest biome, and you'll get a chance to admire the difference in ambience, a lighting switch, and possibly some dangerous creatures. If you're really lucky, or unlucky depending on your perspective, you'll bump into a troll and the game will show you firsthand that it isn't messing around. It's an all around great early game experience, especially when compared to many of the forgettable open world survival crafting games that have come and gone over the years. Additionally, picking things up along the way will automatically reveal the recipes you can craft with these new items, compelling you to whack new kinds of trees and pick up everything you see just to see what is and isn't useful. Once again, it really stands out as an excellent approach to how these games ought to be. Unfortunately, this is where my problems started to set in for me. You've got limited inventory space. A few rows to house your tools, weapons, and your gear. You'll notice that your gear, rather than taking up separate inventory slots, also has to be placed inside your normal inventory. It doesn't seem too restrictive at first. But keep in mind, with a full toolbar of weapons and tools, possibly a few slots for potions, 5 to 8 slots dedicated to food and clothing, arrows for your bow, it starts to shrink quite a bit. It's still not a major problem until you combine it with the other game mechanics. The best foods, for example, take a lot of different ingredients that have to be foraged. You'll need to grab beehives and honey for potions and food, enemies have specific drops as well as their own trophies, there's mushrooms and berries, thistle branches, and other vegetables for potions and food, along with ores and building materials and... Well, you get the idea. Your pockets start to fill up very quickly, whether you're trying to fill them or not. It's not uncommon to leave your base and then within a few minutes not be able to pick up anything else because random items on the ground have filled up your inventory. It's true that you can toggle the ability to auto pick up items, but you may still find yourself needing these items, so you're gonna have to deal with them one way or another. 
The takeaway is that the inventory management can get annoying, but this is still an incredibly minor issue on its own, so for now, just put it aside and keep it in the back of your mind. We'll revisit this later. Once you've killed Aether, you can use his antlers to make your first pickaxe, which you'd presumably use to mine your first metals, typically bronze, which is made from copper and tin. This is where the playthrough really starts to get goofy, though. Uh, get used to seeing this. On the box, so to speak, this game was all about epic Viking adventures, but this is what's going to make up the majority of your time. It was shocking to me just how much time it takes to mine and process ores, since nobody seems to mention it. At best, some reviews will brush it off with, oh, this game can be a little grindy at times, but, and that's the fullest extent of what they have to say. I'm not exaggerating when I say that it might take you upwards of an hour to mine a single vein of copper ore with pitiful yields, and all the while you'll be fighting off a seemingly unending horde of grey dwarves, the occasional troll, and so on. You can set up fires to scare away the dwarves at least, but you'll still be there for a long time. And the problem isn't just that it takes so much time. In most survival games, resource acquisition is something of a puzzle that needs to be solved. You start with a simple problem, I need insert resource, and the solution can take you in a million different directions. In a game like Space Engineers, you can progress from mining by hand to making your own mining ships, all the way to coding your own robots to systematically consume entire asteroids. Even in a game as simple as Minecraft, you can set up a railcart system to transport your loot, auto-deposit, sort, and smelt your materials while setting up highways to speed up your travels. The problem is the same, but how you solve it is completely up to you and will almost certainly vary from person to person. In Valheim, the problem is I need copper, and the solution is to go get it and then bring it all the way back. There's not really any interesting way to interact with the system. The way that you mine copper is identical to everybody else. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that Valheim should have the same levels of automation or complexity as engineering games, but if the farming is going to be this simple, then there's no reason for it to be so tedious. I understand what they're going for here. They're encouraging your resource trip to be more than just mindless farm that gets turned into a process, it's supposed to be part of a larger voyage, the journey as opposed to the destination. Ideally, you find a new biome, take your time exploring it, mine resources as you explore, and it turns into a whole adventure. I would like the idea. I just think that the ore gathering component of that winds up taking a disproportionate amount of your time. A lot of the tedium comes from the travel time, but we'll get to that later. If you think I'm over exaggerating, let me throw some numbers at you. In order to craft a full spread of bronze items and upgrade them, it will cost you a total of 292 bronze bars. That's 584 copper and 292 tin plus an eventual 1,752 wood for all the coal you'll need later. Each copper weighs 10, and each tin weighs 8, and your inventory space is only 300. There is a belt that increases carry weight, but we'll talk about that later. So let's say you've only got maybe 100 of that 300 used up. So you have a usable inventory space of 200. Altogether, it's 8,176 weight that needs to be accounted for. That's over 40 separate inventories of just ores, meaning you're not picking up or gathering anything else. That's not even counting the bronze you'll need for various upgrade benches, fermenters, and so on. Not to mention all the wood you'll need to smelt it all. Keep in mind, this is one of the few grinds that doesn't get any easier with more people. If you add another person, you'll just need twice as much gear. It tends to cancel out. Now remember just how long it takes to mine a copper vein and how small the yields are. And then consider the travel time between nodes and your base or an outpost, and how far the biome might be from your home. Now, go back to the inventory management. As you're mining, you're fighting off dwarves, rocks are falling into your pockets, you've got berries, bones, trophies, resin, wood, feathers, bees, and you need to somehow gather an absurd amount of bronze that by itself will necessitate many, many trips. You can start to see how this gets out of control. Even if you use carts and boats to transport the metals and outposts to deposit the loot before a final transport to cut down on travel time, it's still incredibly tedious. And your first boats only have four inventory slots. So if you're not able to quickly travel over land, the amount of ore that you can viably move is pretty small at first. In fact, it's a really bizarre choice. The ore that you're expected to mine at the start of the game actually requires more inventory space and weight than the other ores at a time when your access to the tech tree gives you the fewest options to deal with those inventory and weight demands. It's a harsh change of pace after the initial fairly enjoyable early game, and becomes especially weird in hindsight, since the next metal you collect is iron and dungeon chests will frequently give it to you 20 at a time. Silver veins tend to be fairly large as well, and black metal drops from almost every enemy in the plains and can also be found inside chests. So why is bronze specifically so demanding? Don't get the wrong idea though. It's not that the other resources aren't grindy, they just enjoy a very different flavor of grind. Because ores are so heavy, and there's so much junk to collect, clearing out a single swamp crypt, for example, might take you 12 trips. You'll take two steps, open a single chest, and find that you're over-encumbered. 
go depot your stuff at an outpost, go back, take two more steps. Now you've got 30 slots worth of bones, entrails, femurs, pearls, amber, and of course more iron, rinse and repeat. These systems have a way of tripping over each other. The inventory management gets in the way of the exploration constantly. Obviously, nobody is going to craft a full spread of bronze and fully upgraded, and you don't need fully upgraded gear to progress. But my point is that even if you only perform a small fraction of this grind, it will still take you a ridiculous amount of time. Especially considering that this is supposed to be one portion of an exciting viking adventure, and not 80% of the journey. But hold on to that for a sec. This was actually the second time I attempted to play Valheim. The first time I played with my fiance, we got past the second boss and got bored and left to play other games. But I learned from that playthrough what a rip off bronze and to some extent all ore farming was. So this time around I played really light. I only built the absolute bare minimum necessary to survive so I could burn past the early game and hopefully just skip straight to iron after farming only as much bronze as was necessary. I figured if I skipped to an iron pickaxe, I could come back and farm all the bronze I needed for benches, boats, and whatnot, and hopefully it wouldn't be so painful so I could progress a little easier. So I killed the first two bosses, made a boat, got to the swamp, and grabbed some iron. Only to find out that an iron pickaxe costs 20 iron, when a bronze pickaxe only takes 10 bronze. This is something that remains an issue throughout the game, where things seem to have their costs adjusted to be arbitrarily expensive, and it actually gets worse over time, but just ignore that for now. I got the iron, I sailed home, and I made my pick. And you know, I was almost a little bit excited to experience the jump in power. Keep in mind, I skipped over an entire portion of the tech tree and went straight from a bone pickaxe to a partially upgraded iron one. I took the time to terraform a little highway from my base to the copper deposits, and even built some land bridges across the river, repair stations dotted throughout, some torches of the works. I had my cart, a streamlined road, and an upgraded pick. I was ready to feel the satisfaction of that no doubt huge technology jump. It was, uh, only marginally faster than before. After all that, I found myself right back where I started, squatting in front of a copper vein, holding down the left mouse button for a small eternity. In a cruel twist of fate, this wound up being even worse, because you can't repair a pick at a workbench, you have to repair it at a forge, and that forge has to be a high enough of a level to match your pick. So if you gave your pick even a single upgrade like I did, you can't just bring a forge with you, you have to bring a forge and its upgrades. Now, this game has portals that you can construct, that link to each other, and basically let you teleport to any area you like, and as far as I know, there's no limit on how many portals you can have. So, repairing your tools doesn't necessarily mean that you have to walk all the way home to do it. And for my playthrough, I made sure to build outposts with portals in every biome I needed, so I could just go home to repair my gear, refresh my rested buff, and so on. It does kind of pose a question, though. Why have the restriction at all? Look at it this way. If I build an outpost with a portal, versus building an outpost with a full spread of crafting benches, they both basically serve the same function. They allow me to repair my gear and continue my journey. One just comes with a load screen, and the other one has a much higher resource cost for no real benefit. Requiring your benches to be a certain level comes off as an arbitrary restriction that doesn't really do anything for the gameplay. It's not that it's a major inconvenience to teleport home and repair stuff, it just doesn't really add anything either, and it actually creates a different problem that we'll talk about later. The portals themselves also won't allow you to transport metal bars or unsmelted ores. So on the one hand, the portals seem to be a sort of admittance that the map can be huge and, depending on your world seed, it can be a nightmare to traverse. And on the other hand, the one item variety you'd really like to transport via portal you can't because, well, you just can't. Which means you either have to carry it all the way back with a cart or sail across the ocean, which could take upwards of 20 minutes depending on the wind and where you're farming. The teleport limit feels especially arbitrary when it comes to the dragon eggs. They weigh 200, so even with the special belt, you can only carry two at most, and that's with an especially empty inventory. It's not really a problem though, since dragon nests spawn in the area where you need those eggs, but that just makes it all the more absurd, since for most maps you don't need to teleport the dragon eggs anyways, and the only time you'd have to is if you had a really bad world seed, so this limit just makes a bad world seed even worse for no real reason. The result of all this combined is that something like 70% of my time in-game was spent either in front of a resource node or paddling my boat across the ocean while watching the wind move to the exact worst possible position every single time I got into a boat. Oh, come on. <laughs> Don't do it to me. You've been so good so far. Ah, I was just about to take a left. Why you gotta do that? I like the sailing mechanics a lot, don't get me wrong, and I won't be too harsh about the relatively empty travel time because I'm sure there's more content coming. As it is, there's sea serpents and monsters with barnacles to farm on their backs floating in the sea, but it's still the case that the absolute vast majority of my travel time consisted of me pointing my ship, setting it to paddle, and then alt-tapping to do something else. 
You do eventually get the ability to mitigate this to an extent with a boss power, but you'll still spend a large portion of the game at the total mercy of the wind and it gets old really fast. And before you say, hey, the smart way to farm is to do all your mining, leave it in an outpost, and then bring it home in one trip. I know, I did that. That's common sense. And if you say that you should use boats and carts to minimize the trips when you farm and that you can carry nails through portals and build your boat on site to save a trip, I know, I did that. That's common sense. If you've seen some of my other videos, farming efficiently is kind of my thing. And if you're about to accuse me of having ADHD or saying that this isn't the right genre for me, I've got over 10,000 hours put into various survival games, both PvE and PvP. It's not the genre, and it's not because I couldn't figure out basic farming principles. I just think Valheim is especially grindy and doesn't do that good of a job at justifying it. I understand why they don't want you to be able to transport metals. I get it. They don't want you to trivialize the system. They want you to explore, build outposts, and invest in your experience. My major problem with it isn't the idea, it's the degree. Once you add it all up, a simple resource run feels like you have to cancel your plans, clear your schedule, and set aside an entire evening for it. I'm not kidding when I say it took me several real-life days across multiple gaming sessions to mine enough silver to fashion a single suit of armor and some weapons plus some upgrades. You can kind of see even here just how deflating it can be to spend all that time farming bronze, only to immediately start farming iron. You finish farming all of that, and then you're immediately moving on to silver and so on and so forth. And then even once you get the ores home, smelting them takes a bit of time and resources as well. It just felt like the grind never ended, because you have to feed the ores and the coal into it manually and keep refreshing it. When I finally later unlocked the blast furnace, I thought I had found a way to speed up the smelting. But it actually cooks at about the same speed as a regular smelter and can only be used for specific metals. I don't really see why this couldn't also operate as an upgrade for regular smelters. By themselves, these problems aren't huge. But combined, they create a sort of background radiation of grind that flavored the rest of my playthrough and made it a lot harder to enjoy myself. As far as inventory management goes, I think there's just too many redundant systems at play. You've got inventory size, weight, and tool durability, which all basically do the same thing by limiting your journey. The forest had a system that I kind of liked, where you could craft bags that would increase the stack size of certain items like sticks and stones. In Valheim, I'd like to see the option to either have your inventory size increased in some way, or to be able to craft specific bags that hold their own kinds of items. Something like an herb pouch to hold all the various vegetables, berries, and resin that you collect as you go, so you can forge for all the food recipes you need without it directly competing with whatever else you're doing. I'd also really like to see a wallet item added. I think it would be the perfect item to find inside troll caves off the body of some unfortunate adventurer. A pouch that would then hold larger amounts of all the rubies, pearls, gold, and amber that you collect in dungeons. I can't tell you how often I'd have to stop a dungeon run because my pockets were just full of randomly assorted currency items. Being able to separate money items and possibly plants, or to even just have a flat increase in inventory size after crafting a bag or something would go a long way towards removing some of the unnecessary tedium from inventory management. As for the ores, I guess on some level I agree that if it was possible to teleport metals, maybe it would trivialize the game in some way, but as I've elaborated, the overall process just takes too much time in too many ways. Consider reducing the number of swings necessary to break a rock for ores, or make the upgrades for your tools give more drastic effects, so when you go back to mine copper with an upgraded iron tool, it doesn't feel like you hadn't made any progress at all. I mean, at the very least, copper specifically has to be revisited. Once you factor in the additional travel time for gathering sporadic tin deposits, the sheer volume of time necessary to mine copper, and the fact that it takes three ore per bar, and it's necessary for multiple benches and forge upgrades and cooking upgrades and fermenters and etc etc, it really shouldn't stay as grindy as it is now all the way into a full release. Just an idea, but I was mining copper and got attacked by a troll with a tree for a weapon, which broke some of the copper vein. At the time I thought, hey, maybe I can have this guy do the mining for me and try to lure him out of the copper, but it wound up not being that much faster than just doing it myself, and I ultimately just wound up dying. But if you were to buff the damage the trolls do to resource veins, that would give an alternate farming method that would reward players like myself for taking risks. Just something to give players a bit of variety, addressing the issue of problem solving while farming that I mentioned earlier. I would say to reduce the weight on ores a bit too, but there's already an item in the game that increases the weight you can carry. But I didn't even find the merchant until after I had basically played through the whole game. So I was stuck at the default carry weight the entire time. I also went through the entire game thinking that there was no way to get rid of items, thinking, man, that's a really crazy oversight with how thoughtful the rest of the game is. Only to learn later that you can craft an item that deletes items, but you have to buy the prerequisites from the merchant I never found. 
All I can say is maybe tighten up his spawn chances so you're more likely to find him earlier on. I'm not saying to make him too easy. I like that this mysterious merchant could be a kind of reward after a grand journey, and I also understand that with random world generation you're always going to get worlds like mine where you just can't find the guy, but not finding him was really detrimental to my playthrough. Maybe inside the skeleton monuments or even on the bodies inside troll caves, consider adding little notes or receipts from people that had found the merchant that hint where he might be. Just something to point you in the right direction, like a broken compass or a cryptic note. I'd also really like the option to throw some of my items into a bonfire to have it disappear with no yield. The item you craft from the merchant gives you coal as far as I understand it, so it would still be an upgrade from just pure deletion. Just give us something to deal with all the junk items you wind up collecting, you know, aka bone fragments. As for repairs, I think benches should be able to repair a certain level above their current level. A level 1 forge should be able to repair up to level 3, for example. This way you don't feel pressure to build a complete and redundant copy of your crafting setup at every outpost, but you also don't necessarily have to go through a loading screen to maintain your tools every time you go mining. And the early game boat should have a bit more storage as well. I can see why you'd want to limit it, but when you've got such a restricted inventory already, four inventory slots on your first boat feels like it's a little bit too small. Your first swap trip is going to get you sirdling cores, goop, bones, ancient wood, entrails, trophies, and so on, and, and yeah, you can teleport most of that stuff home, but it makes you feel like you're working around a problem rather than playing naturally, and it does kind of make you question why you can't just teleport metals along with the rest of it. It also led to some really questionable situations in my playthrough. When I was finally done farming my first suit of armor, my plan was to build a longboat at my outpost and sail it all home except Shit. I don't think I have enough iron to make a longboat when I get back and because I didn't want to have to go all the way to a swamp biome, farm up more iron, bring it home, craft it in a nail before teleporting to my outpost to craft the boat and finally bring home my silver, a task that would have taken another hour or two, instead I got a little creative. Test number one? Not promising. <laughs> I'm about to do a pro gamer move. <laughs> it worked. Not in the right position. Yeah, you could say that. You could say that. Come on. Just get in the boat. Just get in the boat. Get in there. Almost. Almost. Ooh, look at how look at how perfect this is. <laughs> Look! Yeah! That's what I'm talking about! Perfect. Alright. As long as nothing stupid happens, I think we're in the clear. Why did I even say anything? <laughs> ah, if I sink, I'm uninstalling. And look, this was a funny moment for me, but if players are just going to finagle a cart onto their boats anyways to get around the inventory restrictions, I think it would just make for better gameplay if it wasn't so restrictive in the first place. To clarify, I'm not saying to make the game too easy. I appreciate that the game is difficult and I understand what you're going for. I'm just tossing out a couple ideas to reduce some of the unnecessary grind because the core gameplay is really incredibly well made and even fun at times. It's just that for me, the tedium was evidently more of a deal breaker than it was for 96% of other people. Now we can talk about the combat systems. In Valheim, the combat is very similar to something you'd experience in a Souls-like game. You have a stamina meter, a dodge roll with a short invincibility window, and even a parry system. Timing your blocks gives better damage reduction and can leave your enemies vulnerable for a punishing counterattack, and you can stagger enemies by doing a certain amount of damage. Generally speaking, I really enjoy the combat, and I think it's another feature that sets Valheim apart from the competition. As you can probably guess, I was so tired of the grinding in this game, I made a promise to myself to never farm more than I needed to. So I actually didn't farm up bronze or iron armor. I went all the way up to and partially through the planes wearing just upgraded troll armor. I was very squishy, but through good positioning, parrying, and use of weapons with reach, I actually didn't die as much at all, save for a few key encounters. As a result, combat overall felt fair and enjoyable. It felt really good to be able to perform well with good decision making rather than just having grind walls in the way. So before I criticize anything, much like the rest of the game, I just want to stress that I think it's actually really good, and unlike my criticisms of the grind, I'd say the skill and combat systems are really strong on their own. That said, I did have some problems. We'll start with the skill system. As you perform actions, you gain experience and levels for that action. Cutting down trees levels your wood cutting, running improves your running, and so on. It's a leveling system that makes sense, but personally, I've never liked this kind of leveling system because it encourages really monotonous gameplay. 
There were more than a few occasions where I tried to escape from a troll or some other enemy by crossing a river, only to swim just slowly enough that they caught me and killed me. I'd think on the spot, man, it would be nice to have a higher swimming level, but what that would translate into for me is swimming back and forth in shallow water for hours on end. It was giving me flashbacks of playing Oblivion so many years ago, sitting in the Imperial sewers repeatedly casting Summon Skeleton to raise my conjuration. Well, this sucks. I also found that it really worked with the grind to punish players for experimenting. I lucked out in that I wound up almost exclusively using maces and ant gears, which were great for almost every biome. But sometimes I'd hit a new technology tier and it would unlock some new weapon types. Sure, it's cool to see that there's swords and warhammers and spears and whatnot, but if I want to experiment with those new weapons, I'll have to farm up another massive amount of metals to not only craft it, but also upgrade it so that it's on par with my other weapons. And then I'll have low skills for that weapon, so the damage is artificially low unless I go grind with it for a while. And what if I do all that and just wind up not liking the weapon after all? It's one of the biggest reasons I don't like leveling schemes like this. It makes you feel locked into your current choices and makes experimenting feel really shitty. And in Valheim's case, it just exacerbates the grinding. Ultimately, I wound up just ignoring the skill system entirely since when you die, you lose 5% of your skill levels anyways. I've played a lot of PvP survival games, so I'm very used to loss, and the best way to deal with it is to just let it go. On the one hand, I like that death is punishing. It's another good quality that sets Valheim apart from other games and prevents you from just cheesing your way through a certain fight. But when you compare it to similar systems, it's a bit more punishing than I think it needs to be. In Dark Souls, for example, when you die, you drop the souls you're currently carrying, but you don't permanently lose stat levels across the board. And if you make it back to your body, you can retrieve all the souls that you lost. Let me give you an example. I went into Valheim blind, or about as blind as you can get into a popular game in 2021. I had a lot of the game spoiled for me just by YouTube suggestions, but I was still relatively blind. The first swamp biome I found, I didn't know what would be inside, and I really pulled a short straw. The beach was being guarded by a two-star troll and multiple two-star leeches in the water. Tell me I'm not cursed with this game. Tell me I'm not cursed. <laughs> what are the odds? Uh, I think I'm clear at least. I can't get rid of them. They've, they've followed me all the way out of the ocean, and they're underneath the boat. I can't hit them. If I, if I sink to leeches, dude, I'm done. I'm stuck. <laughs> Why wouldn't they go back to the swamp? <laughs> Why wouldn't they fuck off? God damn it. Son of a bitch. Leech. Why didn't you just go home? That's your home! Are you too good for your home? Answer me! Yeah, re really looking forward to explaining that death to the other Vikings. We died fighting against a great beast with thousands of claws. What did you fight before your death? I died to a leech. For anybody doubting that my world seed was cursed, the first swap biome I found only had one crypt inside, and that crypt just had two dead ends inside and no loot. I feel like I'm missing something really crucial here. Because I've been in this crypt for like 30 minutes, and I can't really tell what I'm supposed to do. I google it and they say sometimes it's blocked by mud scraps, but I don't... I don't really see any mud scraps. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty pissed at the time and I'm pretty sure I rage quit. But it makes for a funny story and one of those random events that could make this game really fun to play and talk about. I learned my lesson too and from that point on I always made sure to land my boat in the closest meadows biome to walk over instead so I could at least slap a portal down in the worst case scenario. But as funny as this might have been at first, it immediately became just as painful because now I'd have to go back and get back all of my stuff. If you die somewhere out of the way, retrieving your body can be a serious undertaking. You'll be missing your gear too, since you'll likely die with your best stuff and tools on you. People might say to just keep a spare set of gear on you, but we already covered in the farming section just how absurd of a concept that even is. Farming up just one set of gear is enough of a task. Farming up duplicates as you go is just masochism. Luckily, I did have enough troll skin to toss together a suit at least, but I didn't have enough materials for another good boat, and I could not be bothered to go farm out the bronze for another one. So I slapped together a raft and floated my way back, which took a small eternity. I finally got my body back, landed on a rock, set up an outpost, killed the troll with roughly two and a half trillion arrows, and then I was back on track. But it cost me several hours of my time to recover from this one death. Now, go back to the skill loss on death. Not only have I lost the time I spent retrieving my body, but I've also retroactively lost the time I spent gathering my skills. To me, it kind of felt like retrieving my stuff was already punishment enough. 
And in a weird twist, I was kind of lucky in that my body was out to sea so I could retrieve it safely. But if you've already spent hours farming, hours sailing, hours grinding, and then you die in a situation you might not have had that much control over only to lose even more hours, these systems are overlapping with each other in a way that can be really frustrating. And the only way to get some of those levels back is to go do more grinding. If you get your skills really high and you die, you're potentially losing days worth of grinding at a time. I'm not just saying that they should get rid of it completely, but this system needs some work, so here are a few suggestions. Even though I don't really like these sorts of progressive skill systems, I still think asking for them to get rid of it and just replace it entirely would be an unreasonable ask. What I would like to see though is some kind of control over the system. The final boss's gimmick is sorcery, so I think it'd be cool if you could go to his biomes and find magic items in the fueling monuments that would let you move some of your skill points around for a cost. So that way if you found some new weapon type that you like, you don't have to regrind all your skills, you can just move those points out of a weapon type you don't use anymore. Maybe have it so that at the Stonehenge monuments that are currently unused, you can sacrifice bone fragments and unused trophies to move some of your experience around, or even regain some lost experience. If you want to keep it really punishing, just give these limited uses so you have to use them wisely. If you regain your body in a certain amount of time, or regain your body without dying, I think it should refund some of the lost experience as well. Again, I think it's really great that Valheim has a punishing death system, and I think once some of the other background team is dealt with, you won't have to adjust the death penalty too much. Just enough to keep it dangerous, but not frustrating. At the end of the day, I think giving players some ways to interact with the system beyond raw grind would enhance the experience. Returning to the general combat feedback, there's a dodge roll that you can use which has invincibility frames like most soul games. I don't have much to say about the roll itself, I like it, but I did find it kind of weird that you can't rebind the command. I feel like that might even be intentional, but I think it's a good idea to let people rebind that. I wound up almost never rolling because I found blocking first and then rolling to be a bit clunky since if I was already blocking anyways, I might as well just parry. Maybe consider shortening the iframes as compensation so people can more easily roll in combat but it doesn't turn into a lazy crutch since you still have to time it effectively. I'd also say that, generally speaking, the parry feature is a bit too forgiving. The window of opportunity is huge here. Lots of really difficult encounters become pretty trivial if you experiment with parrying along the way. The golems, for example, are relatively difficult to kill. I largely avoided them until one spawned on top of me while I was mining, and he got stuck in the hole. I found out by pure chance after that that they have a weakness to pickaxes, which felt really fun to discover actually. But while I was experimenting later with trying to duck under one of their attacks to get behind him, because you have to block before you can dodge, I wound up accidentally parrying it. And once you know that you can just parry that attack, golems turn into a bit of a joke. It got to the point where even in the midst of a difficult boss fight surrounded by enemies, a golem spawning under my feet was just a minor inconvenience solved by a few right clicks. Tightening the window for parries would allow enemies to retain their danger while still rewarding more risky, skillful play. But like I said at the beginning though, even with all those complaints, I'd say the combat is very strong on its own, even if it remained completely unchanged, especially compared to Valheim's competitors. So if you were to say that my complaints were fairly nitpicky, I think you'd be right. There were a few things I did consider to be more serious problems though, and they tend to meld together a little bit. And this is where you can really start to tie together all the disparate points I've made throughout this video. Firstly, we'll talk about stamina management, and I'll do it through an example. Fighting fuelings is often difficult due to the numbers. Running out of stamina is essentially a death sentence. In a situation where you might feel pressured to sprint to create distance, you can walk instead and utilize good positioning to avoid attacks, saving you the stamina you need to go in for an attack, dodge roll, or sprint away if necessary. That is stamina management, making decisions that allow you to use your stamina as efficiently as possible. The problem is that the environment and the hitboxes often conspire to make stamina management more of a stamina tax. Whenever you come into contact with a slight incline, you have to sprint to be able to climb up it, otherwise you'll slide right off. It's not usually a problem, but in certain biomes like the mountains or a particularly hilly black forest biome, you basically have to sprint to move at all. Worse still, if there's any difference in elevation between you and the target, your hits are very likely not going to hit at all. You can watch your weapon phase right through the target and not do any damage. It doesn't work that way in the reverse though, because enemies have an incredibly forgiving hitbox and will be able to hit you from several feet away at times. So go back to the fueling example we started with. There were more than a few situations where I'd be surrounded by fuelings. I'd walk at an angle and attempt to weave around an attack to conserve my stamina, only to get hit from a fueling that was well out of visible attack range. So now I have to sprint, and I've also had to lose health. After regaining my stamina, I tried to break out by killing a single fueling in front of me, opening an escape route. Except that all of my attacks phase right through the fueling due to the hitboxes. 
Now I'm in attack range of the fueling, I'm even lower on stamina than I was before, and I've already lost some health due to the last hitbox issue. Keep in mind there's a delay for stamina regen, so every time you hesitate, use a skill, attack, block, or roll, your stamina regen is delayed that much longer. So any built-in stamina issues are made that much worse when the game forces you to use it in situations where you were trying to conserve it. It was a situation that played out very frequently in the planes. You wouldn't expect it either since the elevation differences here are fairly mild, but it really doesn't take much at all to cause this problem. And it goes without saying that in the mountains it can really become a problem since every one of those biomes is, well, comprised of mountains, where basically every single step costs stamina. Additionally, armor and weapon pieces come with a move speed penalty when equipped. It would be fine if pure mobility was a bit more viable, but later biomes especially seem to really demand a certain level of damage reduction, as death skeetos, fuelings, and whatever the tar blobs are called can hit extremely hard. So you wear the armor to stay alive, but now you're spending 10% more stamina just to move at all due to the move speed decrease. If you're using weapons, it could be another 10% reduction. It really doesn't feel good, especially when you could put it in the context of stamina management. Now, walking circles around certain enemies is that much harder due to the loss of mobility, and the stamina cost of putting distance between you and them is higher, as well as the cost of getting in range if a target is further away. So what you get when you put it all together is a lot of situations where death can be unavoidable or at the very least out of your control. Not because you position poorly or made an error in judgment, but because the mechanics fail you in the case of the hitboxes, or you're in an environment where managing your stamina just isn't as possible, which is in the case with any real incline. You could say to just avoid areas with steep inclines, but that's only possible some of the time. For example, if you're mining silver, you're basically gonna be inside a hole. You can build a wall around every single silver vein if you're really feeling masochistic, but sometimes those veins are in very awkward locations. And in this situation, all you're doing is preventing an unfair death with more grind on a system that already has way too much grind. And remember, every death comes with a mandatory permanent loss of skills. So as you struggle with this system, you're becoming imperceptibly weaker, losing strength as you progress as opposed to gaining it, very likely due to situations that you had no control over. And if one of those unfair deaths put your body in a terrible location, then you might have to go farm up new gear, which brings us right back to a few more hours of mining and sailing, so you'd see how all these problems start to layer onto each other. Now don't misunderstand me. The absolute majority of my deaths in Valheim were my own fault. I'd say a good 50% of them were for me either naked running to a corpse because I was too lazy to grab my spare gear, positioning poorly, getting stuck on a piece of terrain I was trying to lure an enemy around, you know, those kinds of things. Or, you know, going AFK to take a piss outside my base instead of going inside and then coming back to find a singular Grey Dwarf shambled over and beat me to death. Then there's the expected deaths, trying out new things, exploring new biomes, leeches, you know, random events. Uh, what? I'm not wearing armor, and you can't make me. What just happened? Generally, they were all natural deaths that I'd say are just fine and added to the experience in a good way, making the world feel dangerous and real. So I'm not saying that death is always bullshit in Valheim, and it's by no means the majority of cases. Only that when an unfair death does happen, it stings so much more because of everything else around it. The endgame boss fights were the encounters that really took everything I was going to hate about Valheim and squeezed them into individual encounters. The bosses are already featured in a lot of the promotional material for the game, and the first few are in every single Valheim thumbnail, but if for whatever reason you don't want to have them spoiled, skip ahead. As I was writing the script for the stamina portion, a patch went live that lowered the cost of attacks and rebalanced some food stamina ratios. So I did my due diligence and tried some of the fights where stamina was the biggest problem for me, mostly boss fights, but still arrived at very similar outcomes because the stamina issues have less to do with your stamina pool and more to do with the encounters, terrain, and so on. Before I complain about anything though, I really did like the boss fights, even the annoying ones. They're an excellent way to wrap up an area and they really do feel like a satisfying finish to whatever stage of the game that you're at. They're incredibly cinematic and usually feel pretty fun as well. My favorite was probably Bone Mass. It was a perfect mix of difficulty while still being approachable for me as a solo. Plus I just tend to like ugly monsters and swampy biomes. I was already fooling around with fermentation, so being able to use poison resistance potions to stand inside his puke attack for another additional damage window felt really rewarding. And the ads didn't become overwhelming either. Bone Mass was located right on the beach, so I'd spent plenty of time terraforming the land around it so I wouldn't be swimming the whole fight. And that really paid off. The extra mobility that gave me was super helpful. It genuinely felt like I was fully interacting with the system in multiple different ways. After those first three bosses though, they start to get a little ridiculous. 
Now, I know that by choosing to play this game solo, I put myself at a slight disadvantage, so I'm not going to complain so much about the incredibly high health pools, even though I did think it was a little excessive at times. The real trouble is everything else that high health invites. For starters, your weapons often don't have enough durability to complete an entire boss fight. Even early on, you'll find that you'll have to bring backup weapons with you if you want to beat a boss in one sitting. It's not too bad until you get to Modar and Yaglith, where you'll find that you'll have to repair your gear multiple times in a single fight. Part of this is due to the health regen that bosses have, which can get pretty annoying for longer fights, but a lot of it is also because weapons that aren't fully upgraded have much, much lower durability. So if you're like me and you didn't find the merchant for certain powerful weapons, and you didn't want to spend a week getting the absolute highest tier upgrades, then your fights are going to take considerably longer to complete. And I'm sure a few of you are screaming at your screens right now, well then it's your fault for being impatient. Which, you know, to some extent might be true, but look at the opportunity cost here. To avoid the tax of having to constantly repair your gear, you're back at the resource and transport grind, which could take hours depending on what upgrades you need and what resources they require. If you want to build a full repair station at a boss fight rather than use portals and risk respawning enemies, you have to either bring an entire duplicate of your home crafting setup, which means more farming and transport, or at the very least you have to dismantle all your benches at home and bring them with you, which still requires a lot of travel time. So even if your boss fights were overall faster, you still paid that time somewhere else. And from my perspective, what was worse? Spending 2 hours to make this fight shorter, or spending the extra 20 minutes fighting. As bad as the fights were for me, it was still overall faster to just suffer through it. Which is my biggest complaint. Playing through the game the correct way is often more tedious than just suffering through it. I'm sure I'm still going to get tons of comments from people who have developed a poisonous sense of elitism over this game. To people like this, uh, do you guys ever get tired of the smell of your own farts? Or is it just like all farts all the time? This one's great. Let me read this one to you. This game is certainly not for lazy or unim unimaginative people. <laughs> this guy's so full of himself right out of the gate. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Use your brain. Be creative. Plan and adapt. What, 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 is it, what is it with people like this and the word adapt? <laughs> like they've just... <laughs> Hey, reel it in, big guy. You didn't cure cancer. You farmed it a video game, all right? It's uh, it's not exactly rocket science, okay? <laughs> I just imagine this dude farming copper and being like, I bet I'm the only one who is smart enough to use carts to transport it. <laughs> uh, I love reading comments like these, dude. Everyone is stupid except me. But listen, if you didn't hate me already for this review, let me make it a little easier for you. If you don't have at least a few thousand hours in a full loot survival PvP game, don't even waste your time accusing me of being impatient. Getting wiped on a daily basis and having to start over takes patience. Pointing your ship in the direction of your destination before alt-tabbing for 30 minutes? That's not patience. Sitting in front of a node for an hour and spending several days on a set of gear isn't patience either. It's just complacency. Because this isn't really content or gameplay. It's just padding. The game only takes as long as it takes to complete because every step along the way is arbitrarily time consuming. It's one thing if the payoff is a one of a kind. I made a whole feature length film practically over a single playthrough I had in Conan. But the grind in Valheim isn't justified by a payoff. You're only grinding because the game makes you grind. And if you do all the grinding, you might be spared some later tedium. But only some. And the whole time you're grinding, you have very little creative control over how you grind. So it really just does feel like a chore that has to be done. Contrast this with the grind for building, which, by comparison, feels like a joy to complete. Working with a building system felt fantastic, because everything just works. Except for real, and not just as a marketing line. Transporting building resources was so much easier, and farming them was surprisingly easy as well. So building my cozy little settlement felt really good, actually. And even after building two layers of walls surrounded by spikes and decorative structures and so on, it's because I actually got to apply my creativity here to do something that is unique to me. I may not be the best builder, but this is definitely my home. The resource grind for everything else, as I covered earlier, leaves almost no room for experimentation and reward. It made that entire portion of the game so unpleasant to me, that I avoided it to my own detriment for the entire playthrough, even though the game continuously tried to force me into it. So back to the boss fights. If you're like me and you didn't google your way through the game to find optimal weaknesses and which biomes to search to find the merchant, you can be put in a situation where you're locked into boss fights that feel terrible even when they really shouldn't. Whether that's due to suboptimal weapon durability, respawning enemies, buggy hitboxes, the raw duration of the fights, there's always something dragging it down. And of course, if you die as a result of any of those factors, it's more lost time and lost skill points. 
Never mind the fact that the bosses themselves are often on hills and inclines, you can take the risk of getting into melee range with some of the hardest hitting enemies in the game, whiff a bunch of shots, and then lose health and stamina for nothing. Then you return to the pattern of going home to repair your gear and regain your rested buff before continuing the fight. Rinse and repeat for however long it takes you to kill the boss, which will almost certainly be longer than it takes to grow tired of the fight. And the only way to mitigate many of the negative portions of these fights is to go do more grinding for skills and resources. I fully recognize that with a group, this would have been considerably less as painful. And believe me, almost everybody I knew was asking me to play Valheim with them when they bought it. But that's part of the reason why I like to play through games solo when I intend to make a review. I think the company you bring can cloud your judgement and cause you to overlook certain things. Growing up, I played a game that we called Stuck with my friends. Basically, you'd take turns throwing a knife at your foot to see how close you could get it. That's it. That's the whole game. And we had a blast playing it. I'm not comparing Valheim to the act of throwing a knife at your foot in a desperate attempt to stave off poverty-induced boredom. I'm just saying that even something as stupid as that can be fun with the right company. While playing alone gives you the chance to really look at the underlying systems and see if they work. And the Yaglith fight was where it was abundantly clear that some of them just didn't. It was everything I grew to hate over the course of my playthrough bundled into an encounter that should have been the epic climax of a grand adventure. I gotta say I wasn't feeling it. The icing on the cake is that this fight was preceded by one of the most ridiculous quests I've ever had to complete in a game. Just finding and reaching Yagluth was a process that took me several days. It's time consuming enough to clear all those planes by myself, but apparently the likelihood of finding one of those stones that point to the Yagluth is incredibly rare. I cleared biome after biome over the course of days, traveling, scouting, clearing, fighting, dying, and so on. Adding this to my original playthrough, at this point I had already put 65 hours into this game, with the majority of that time being pure tedium. I just wanted it to be over at this point. But I wasn't ready to use admin commands to reveal the whole map yet, so I'll admit I flew instead, justifying it to myself for the idea that all I was doing was cutting the travel time. I'd still be physically visiting the biomes at least. But even here, biome after biome, hour after hour, I was ready to jump off a cliff. After 13 empty plains biomes, I caved and I just used a world generator app to show me where the stones are. Still trying to not spoil everything. And of course, even when it tells me where all the stones are, you can see that almost every single plains biome has no stone in it. So I flew to one and it showed me where Yaglith was and he was all the way over here. But now that the map is revealed, you can see the problem. There are two extremely tall continents in the way. I repped all along one beach and up the other, constantly hitting obstacles. It was my longest and yet still completely uneventful sailing trip yet. At this point, I just didn't even know what to think anymore. I took the time to reflect on my playthrough and just how much of it was characterized by meaningless busy work and empty traveling. But at least it was almost over, I could finally put this game behind me. And then of course I actually fought Yaglith and you know how that went. I really hope that World Generation gets another pass before the game leaves early access. For the most part it isn't too bad, but I've googled it a little bit since my playthrough and I'm not the only person who really had a lousy time trying to find Yaglith. There are quite a few people that say it's their most hated part of the game and the point that makes them quit. And now that I've revealed the map I know where the merchant is, but for my entire playthrough I didn't. This was because he was across a largely featureless ocean. And because I didn't want to risk a boat or some loot sailing endlessly into the sea, since I wasn't sure if I could take on a sea serpent alone, I generally made limited journeys across bodies of water. It wasn't the fear of loss, it was the fear of grind. And when I eventually did give up and start making long journeys across water, I got unlucky and just didn't pick the right directions. So it goes without saying that I think the number of stones that show Yagla's location should be increased. When looking at the world generator, almost every single plains biome has no marker in it. If I had continued scouting for it, finding him legitimately on this map would have taken me forever. Potentially days and days of sitting at the same tech level, having no new experiences, just endless, mind-numbing searching. I know there's more content coming for sea travel, and I know that there's going to be more content later throughout the quiet moments in the game, but I could still see this being a huge issue for me, even with a few things to see along the way. It's one thing to have a large, epic adventure, and it's another thing to just take way too much time for no reason. To address the bosses, I would not nerf them. A lengthy, challenging, difficult fight at the end to a long journey would be a satisfying conclusion. And really, the final boss should be difficult. Difficult to fight, and maybe even difficult to find. I don't have a problem with it demanding the absolute best gear, and maybe even some wolf companions to defeat. As with many other issues in the game, it's everything else around the fights that needs to be looked at. Once all of that background tedium is reined in, I could see myself really enjoying these fights. But as it is, they just highlight everything that's wrong with Valheim. I know the video has been largely critical at times, but that's mostly due to the fact that every other review seems to gloss over any problem the game has, if they mention them at all. As I said, 
this is my attempt to give some of the negative feedback the developers are probably lacking, especially since this game seems to inspire a kind of toxic elitism from its fan base. And if you don't believe me, please scroll down to the comment section, I'm sure it's going to be a disaster before long. I've already got my popcorn ready, believe me. But I'd also just like to make it clear once again that I don't think Valheim is a bad game. There were a lot of times where I really did enjoy myself while playing. I never even talked about the food because to be honest, I think it's a brilliant system and I have nothing to add to it or complain about. It's a great solution to the pointless hunger meters of every other survival game that just feel like a chore. It felt great to forage and cook and experiment as cooking is something that I love to do in real life as well. Finding new ingredients in Valheim and having new recipes pop up was something I love to see. The art style is fantastic as well. I've always said that games waste their money on having high-end graphics that just look like a shittier version of real life, when what they should do is invest in good art direction, something Valheim has clearly done. The biomes look gorgeous and the weather effects are fantastic. I'm a sucker for changing skyboxes and light tones since they really enhance the feeling of difference when moving from one place to another. Seeing the sky shift from darkness in misty biomes to red in the ashlands and to hues of a setting sun in the forest was great. The low poly style imbues the whole game with a level of charm that you don't get from games trying to be overly realistic. And dudging crawling through crypts and busting low poly skeletons is something I'll never be able to hate my entire life. Even once I got later in the game and could farm Serling cores directly, I still preferred to go into the woods and clear crypts, gathering mushrooms for recipes, slapping around the charming skeletons and ghosts, and gathering a little bit of gold along the way, even though I didn't really know what to do with it. Valheim does a lot with a little, and I'm excited to see what the developers do with the unfinished biomes. I found a number of locations where the world generation put certain biomes right next to each other in a way that made me really want to build a permanent home there, which I still might someday. And even though the combat has its flaws, in the absolute majority of cases I found myself really enjoying it. Getting slapped around by trolls is basically the Valheim rite of passage, but even Draugr, Blobs, and Fuelings were fun to fight. Tending to my gardens, expanding my small home, and even setting up cozy outposts and hostile biomes. It all works incredibly well together, or at least it would work a little better if not for everything else. So the question for you is, are the negatives enough to outweigh the positives? And for a whopping 96% of people, the answer to that question is no. Even I would say the game is still worth your money, though I would highly recommend that you play it with friends because playing solo really makes the game a nightmare. For me though, the negatives were just a bit too much to ignore. And even though I can recognize and admit without any reservations that Valheim is probably the best iteration of the survival gameplay loop, it still kind of felt painfully familiar. Punching trees, mining stone, building a medieval themed settlement. I just couldn't shake the feeling that I had done this before. I don't hold that against Valheim either, and as I've said, they've done a lot to differentiate themselves, not just visually, but technically as well. But it was really difficult to enjoy the things Valheim did do well, when the game constantly seemed to bury those things under a mountain of tedium. Every time I started to enjoy myself, every time I was settling into the groove and starting to like the game, there would be something there to snap me out of it. So to summarize, Valheim is a fantastic game and I really respect what it does. I just didn't like it. And just know that if you still hate me at the end of this video, Leaving an angry comment and thumbing down the video actually boosts engagement and helps the channel out a lot, so please, go down to the comment section and let it all out. I promise I won't be mad.